at 1 p.m. at uh, the Congregation Yeshua at 568 LaDonna Drive, Suite J in Decatur, Georgia. Um, even though last month was uh, February, was Black History Month, I'm going to take a page from Congress who stated that Black history sh should not be celebrated just for one month. It actually should be celebrated every day. So in deference to that statement, I'd like to share some fascinating information that I learned during my studies during that coveted month. Um, I think our cre creator said it best in his book, The Bible, that we have an obligation to study to show ourselves approved. And also he stated that our people, that is the black people, we are, um, destroyed by a lack of knowledge. So many of us do not know that the contributions that we, the black people, have made to this country to make it what it is today, and especially about our black inventors and thinkers. So today, I'd like to share with you black genius, celebrating the innovations and contributions of black Americans. According to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, black Americans hold more than 2,000 patents for inventions that have changed the lives of all people in America and throughout the world. And that number is growing every day. So what is a patent? A patent is a property right granted by the government to an inventor. Webster's Dictionary defines a patent as a government authority or license conferring a right or title for a set period, especially the sole right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention. And who can apply for a patent? A patent, a patent can be applied for only in the name of the actual inventor. And how long does a patent protection last? Uh, utility patents are generated uh, for a term of 20 years from the date that the patent was first applied, and design patents last 14 years from the date that it's granted. Despite the hardships suffered through slavery, many black Americans have managed to become great inventors, scientists, and thinkers. Today, I'd like to focus on some individuals deemed to be the 10 top greatest and innovative black American inventors who have changed the fabric of technology and design in this country and even the world. Norbert Rillaloo. He's the inventor of a sugar refining machinery. Safety, efficiency, and profitability. These are the major reasons for the success of an invention. A greater qualification is when the invention revolutionizes an industry. Norbert Rillaloo can certainly be seen to have achieved all of these goals. Rillaloo was born on March 17, 1806 in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was born a free man, although his mother was a slave, his father was a wealthy white engineer involved in the cotton industry. And as a child, Norbert was educated in Catholic school system in New Orleans, but was sent to Paris, France for advanced schooling. He studied at the L'Ecole Centrale, the top engineering school in the country, and at age 24 became an instructor of applied mechanics at the school, the youngest person to achieve this position. In, nine, in, excuse me, in 1834, Rillaloo returned home to his father's plantation, which was used to process and refine sugar. Sugarcane had become the dominant crop in Louisiana, but the sugar refining process employed at that time was extremely dangerous and very inefficient. Known as the Jamaica train, the process called for sugarcane to be boiled in huge open kettles and then strained to allow the juice to be separated from the cane. The juice was then evaporated by boiling it at extreme temperatures, resulting in granules left behind in the form of sugar. The danger stemmed from the fact that the workers were forced to transport the boiling juice from one kettle to another and often suffered severe burns. It was also very costly because the large amounts of fuel needed to heat the kettles. During the 1830s, France introduced the steam-operated single-pan vacuum. The vacuum pan was enclosed in an area where the air was removed because liquid can boil at a lower rate in the absence of air, thus making the process less costly. 
Rillaloo decided to improve greatly on this efficiency by including a second and later a third pan with each getting its heating source from its predecessor. Norbert invented the triple evaporation pan system, better known as multiple effect vacuum pan evaporator, which he patented in 1843. This device heated sugar cane in a partial vacuum, reducing its boiling point, allowing much greater fuel efficiency. This innovation was an enormous success and revolutionized the sugar refining industry, improving efficiency, quality, and safety. It escalated production, reduced the price, and was responsible for transforming sugar into a household item. Some have called Rillaloo's evaporator the greatest invention in the history of American chemical engineering. Rillaloo died on August, excuse me, October 8, 1894, and left behind a legacy of having revolutionized the sugar industry and therefore changing the way the world would eat. Louis Latimer. He's the inventor of the long life lasting light bulb. Louis Latimer is considered one of the most important inventors of all time, not only for the sheer number of ventures created and patented, but for the magnitude of importance for his most famous discovery, the long life light bulb. Louis Latimer was born on September 4, 1848 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. His parents were George and Rebecca Latimer, both runaway slaves, who migrated to Massachusetts in 1842 from Virginia. At the age of 15, Lewis joined the United States Navy and served during the Civil War. After receiving an honorable discharge, he gained employment as an office boy with a patent law firm, Crosby and Gould, earning $3 a week. But after observing Latimer's ability to sketch patent drawings, he was eventually promoted to the position of head draftsman, earning $20 a week by 1872. In 1880, after moving to Bridgeport, Connecticut, Latimer was hired as an assistant manager and draftsman for the U.S. Electric Lighting Company, owned by Hiram Maxim. Maxim was the chief rival to, to Thomas Edison, the man who invented the electric light bulb. Thomas Edison's light was composed of a glass bulb which surrounded a carbon wire filament, generally made of bamboo, paper, or thread. When the filament was burned inside, the bulb became so hot it actually glowed. Before this time, most lighting was delivered either through candle, gas lamps, or kerosene lamps. Latimer desired to improve the Edison's light bulb and focused on its main weakness, its short lifespan. Edison's light bulb generally only lasted a few days. Lewis has devised a way of encasing the filament within a cardboard envelope, which prevented the carbon from breaking and thereby provided a much longer life to the bulb and made the bulbs less expensive and more efficient. This enabled electric lighting to be installed within homes and throughout the streets. Latimer's ability in electric lighting became well known and soon he was sought after to continue to improve incandescent lighting as well as arc lighting. In 1890, Lewis Latimer was hired by Thomas Edison to work in his legal department as a chief draftsman and a patent expert. And later that year, he wrote the world's most thorough book on electric lighting, Incandescent Electric Lighting, a Practical Description of the Edison System. Throughout the rest of his life, Lewis Latimer continued to try to devise ways of improving everyday living for the public, eventually working in efforts to improve the civil rights of black citizens within the United States. Lewis Latimer died on December 11, 1928, and left behind a legacy of achievement and leadership that much of the world owes thanks. Jan Ernest Matzelinger, the inventor of the shoe lasting machine. Sometimes the greatest inventions are those which simply n simplify a necessary task, such as the case of Jan Ernest Matzelinger, the man who made it possible for ordinary citizens to purchase shoes. 
Jan was born in Dutch Guiana, now known as Suriname, in South America in 1852. His father was a Dutch engineer and his mother was born in Dutch Guiana and was of African ancestry. Jan came to the United States in 1873, and although he spoke very little English, he was good with his hands and mechanically inclined. In Lynn, Massachusetts, he began working for a cobbler and became interested in shoemaking. At this time, more than half of the shoes produced in the United States came from the small town of Lynn, Massachusetts. In the shoe factories in Lynn, Jan operated a McKay sole sewing machine, uh, which was used to attach different parts of a shoe together. Unfortunately, no machine existed that could attach the upper part of the shoe to the sole. Attaching these parts together was done by people and it was done by hand. And the people able to sew the parts of the shoe together were called hand lasters. And expert ones could produce about 50 pairs of shoes in a 10 hour work day. And because work was done by hand, lasters were able to charge lots of money and a pair of shoes was very expensive. Hand lasters were confident that they would always be able to demand large sums of money for their services, saying, no man could build a machine that will last shoes and take away the job of a laster unless he can make a machine that has fingers like a laster, and that's impossible. Jan Matzelinger decided they were wrong. And after working all day, Jan took classes at night to learn English, and soon he was able to read well enough to study books on physics and mechanical science. Watching the hand lasters all day, Jan began understanding how they joined the upper parts of the shoe to the sole, and at night, he devised methods for imitating the mannerisms of a hand laster and sketched out rough drawings of a machine that might work in the same manner. Soon, Jan built a working model of his invention. After six months, he finished his third model of the machine, and at this point, he applied for a patent for the device. Because no one could believe that anyone could create a machine which could duplicate the work of an expert laster, the patent office sent a representative to Lynn, Massachusetts to see the device in action. On March 20th, 1883, Jan was issued a patent for his shoe lasting machine. And within two years, Jan had perfected the machine to the point that it could produce up to 900 pairs of shoes each day. As compared to 50, 50 pairs a day for a hand laster. As a result of his work, Shoe manufacturing increased as did efficiency. This lowered prices for consumers and increased jobs for the workers. Jan Matzelinger left behind a legacy of tackling what most thought was impossible, making shoes affordable for the masses. Sadly, Jan Matzelinger would in only enjoy his success for a short period of time as he became afflicted with tuberculosis in 1886 and died on August 24th, 1889 at the tender age of 37. Granville T. Woods. He was an inventor of a variation of the induction telegraph. The magnitude of inventor's work can often be defined by the steam as in which his fellow inventors hold him. Granville T. Woods was certainly a respected inventor, as he was often referred to as the black Thomas Edison. Granville was born on April 23, 1856 in Columbus, Ohio. He spent his early years attending school um, until the age of 10, then at which point he began working in a machine shop, repairing railroad equipment and machinery. Intrigued by electricity that powered the machinery, he moved around the country working on railroads and in steam rolling mills. And this experience helped to prepare him for a formal education studying engineering. But the biggest thing that's known about him is the fact that no one knows where he went to school. After college, Granville worked for DNS Railroads, driving a steam locomotive, and unfortunately, despite his high aptitude and valuable education and experience, Granville was denied opportunities and promotions because of the color of his skin. 
and out of frustration and a desire to promote his abilities, Granville and his brother Laetes formed the Woods Railway Telegraph Company in 1884. The company manufactured and sold telephones, telegraph, and electrical equipment. In 1885, Granville patented an apparatus, which was a combination of a telephone and a telegraph. The device, which he called telegraphony, was, would allow a telegraph station to send voice and telegraph messages over the single wire. The device was so successful, he later sold it to American Bell Telephone Company. In 1887, Granville developed his most important invention to date, a device called the Synchronous Multiplex Railway Telegraph. This was a variation of an induction telegraph. It allowed for messages to be sent from one train to the railway station, but this allowed dispatchers to know the location of each train. It provided for great efficiency and decreases in railway accidents because the system was for letting the engineer of a train know how close his train was to others. Granville often, though, had difficulties in enjoying his success, as other inventors would often claim his devices. Thomas Edison made one of these claims, and Granville was twice successful in defending himself against Thomas Edison and his patents. After the second defeat, Edison decided it would be better to work with Granville than to go against him and offered him a position at Edison Company. Over the course of his lifetime, Granville would obtain more than 50 patents for inventions, including the current electrical system used today for the railway systems, the concept of the third rail, an improved steam boiler furnace, and the automatic brake. And for improvements to other inventions such as safety circuits, the telephone, the telegraph, and the phonograph. When he died in January 30th, 1910, in New York City, he was admired and well-respected inventor, having sold numbers of his devices to such giants as Westinghouse, General Electric, and American Engineering. Most importantly, he was known amongst his fellow inventors and to the world as an electrical genius and the black Thomas Edison. Madam C.J. Walker the inventor of hair lotions for black women. Sarah Breedlove, who later became known as Madam C.J. Walker, was born on December 3rd, excuse me, 23rd, 1867, in Delta, Louisiana, the daughter of Owen and Minerva Breedlove. Her parents were former slaves working as sharecroppers, and both died when Sarah was a child. Sarah ran away and married Moses McWilliams when she was 14 years old, and in 1885 gave birth to her daughter Lilia two years later. However, her husband Moses was murdered by a lynch mob. After this tragedy, Sarah moved with her daughter to St. Louis, Missouri, where she worked as a cook and a house cleaner. Unfortunately, all the stress and hardship had begun to take its toll on her, and she found her hair falling out. She tried several products on the market which claimed would help her condition, but none did. Sarah's company, though, was built on a dream she had. She said that a large black man appeared to her in a dream and gave her the formula for curing borderless. After she shared this formula with some of her friends and found it successful for them as well, she realized that there were no hair care products for black women. So she decided to go into business selling her products to black women. In 1905, Sarah met Charles Joseph C.J. Walker, a newspaper man with the ability for marketing. She married Walker on January 4, 1906, and this is how she acquired her most famous moniker, Madam C.J. Walker. She took her husband's name, and the, company, and the couple set up Madam C.J. Walker's Manufacturing Company. At the guidance of her husband, she began advertising in black newspapers throughout the United States and wanting her company to grow immensely. Sarah devoted herself to the business, including going door to store to sell her hair products. Her hard work did pay off. In 1908, 
Sarah started Lalia College of Beauty in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which trained women about hair care and how to sell the products from door to door. In 1910, she had more than 1,000 sales agents. And in that same year, she moved the company's headquarters to Indianapolis, Indiana, and soon the company grew beyond anyone's expectations. By 1914, the woman who only nine years earlier had only $2 to her name was now worth more than a million dollars. Her products ranged from hair conditioners and facial creams to the ever-coveted hot comb, especially made for black hair and black consumers. She was the first black American woman millionaire. After her early suffering and poverty plague existence, Sarah Breedlove McWilliams had looked for a way out. And as Madam C.J. Walker, she was able to retire after she purchased a 20 room mansion built off of the Hudson River in New York City. Sarah died on May 25, 1919 at the age of 51. She was mourned throughout the black community as a pioneer and a black industrialist. For many women, black and white, she served as an inspiration and a role model. Um, further, as part of her legacy, Sarah wanted her home to be a refuge to women and her New York estate became the Annie Perth home for the aged. Garrett Morgan, the inventor of the gas mask and a type of traffic light. Garrett Morgan was one of those rare people who were able to come up with extraordinary inventions which have tremendous impact on the world. Garrett Morgan was born March 4th, 1877 in Paris, Kentucky. He was the seventh of 11 children born to Sidney and Elizabeth Morgan. At the age of 14, te, um, he's seeking a better education. He moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he learned the inner workings of sewing machines. And in 1909, he opened a tailoring shop where he discovered his first invention. While trying to develop a liquid to polish sewing machine needles, he actually made a few fluid that would straighten fibers. In order to confirm his theory, he tried this fluid on himself. First, he applied small portions to his hair and then to his entire head. He was successful and invented the first human hair straightener. Uh, he marketed and sold the product under the name G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Cream. The G.A. Morgan uh, Refining Company became a very successful business. And in 1912, he then developed another invention, very different from the hair straightener. Morgan called it a safety hood and then patented it as a, a breathing device. But the world came to know it as a gas mask. The safety hood consisted of a hood worn over the head of a person um, from which emanated a tube which reached near the ground and allowed for clean air to come in. The bottom of the tube was lined with a sponge type material that would help filter the incoming air. Another tube allowed the user to exhale air out of the device. Morgan intended the device to be used to enable firemen to enter a home that was on fire with suffocating gases and smoke and to breathe freely and enable them to perform their duties saving lives without endangering themselves from suffocation. The device was also used for protecting engineers, chemists, and other workers who had to use the uh, noxious fumes or were breathing in dust. While demonstrating uh, were good for sales, the true test of the product came under real life circumstances. And on July 25th, 1960, Garrett Morgan made national news uh, for using his gas mask to rescue 32 men trapped during an explosion in the underground tunnels 250 feet beneath Lake Erie. After rescuing uh, these individuals, Garrett's company received requests from fire departments around the country who per wished to purchase the new gas mask. However, once they found out the inventor was a black man, a lot of them withdrew their interest. They would rather suffocate and die than have a device made by a black person. 
with the outbreak of World War I, uh, Garrett's safety hood now became known as the gas mask and was utilized by the United States Army and saved thousands of soldiers' lives. Although he could have relied on the income of his gas masks and what it generated, he felt compelled to try to solve safety problems of the day. And after witnessing a collision between an automobile and a horse-drawn carriage, Garrett decided to invent a way to automatically direct traffic without the need of a policeman or a worker being present. Now, other inventors had marketed traffic signals. However, Garrett Morgan was the first to require a patent for an inexpensive way to produce a traffic signal on November 20th, 1923. Garrett's traffic signal was a T-shaped pole with arms, but with no lights. There were three signs, one or more of which popped out at a time. A red one for stop, a green one for go, and another grit red that stopped in all directions. This signal let pedestrians cross the street. It was controlled by an electric clock mechanism. This device became very popular and was used all around the USA. Satisfied with his efforts, Garrett sold the rights to his device to, the elect to General Electric Company for an astounding sum of that time of $40,000. And it became the standard across the country. Today's modern traffic lights are based upon Garrett's original design. In his later years, Garrett Morgan would develop glaucoma and would thereby lose 90% of his vision. Mr. Morgan died on July 27, 1963, but because of his contributions, the world is definitely a much safer place. Frederick McKinley Jones, the inventor of the refrigeration system for long haul trucks. Frederick McKinley Jones was one of the most prolific black inventors ever. He patented more than 60 inventions. Fred Jones was born on May 17, 1893 in Covington, Kentucky. His father was a white railroad worker of Irish descent and his mother was black. At an early age, Fred demonstrated a great interest in mechanical workings. He became interested in automobiles so much so that upon turning 12 years old, he ran away from home and began working at R.C. Crothers Garage. Fred spent so much of his time watching the mechanics as they worked on cars, his observations along with a voracious appetite for learning through reading developed within Fred an incredible base of knowledge about automobiles. R.C. Crothers' main, uh, garage main business was building race cars. And after a few years of building these cars, Fred desired to drive them and soon became one of the most well-known race car drivers in the Great Lakes region. However, Frederick McKinley Jones is best known for inventing an automatic refrigeration system for long-haul trucks. It was a roof-mounted cooling device. In 1935, Fred Jones designed a portable air conditioning unit for these trucks, making it possible to ship perishables long distances at any time of the year, thereby eliminating spoilage. The system was in turn adapted to a variety of other common characters, excuse me, carriers, including the trains, the ships, and aircraft. Fred was issued a patent for the vehicle air conditioning device, which was later called a Thermo King on July 12, 1949. This product revolutionized several industries, including the shipping and grocery businesses. Grocery chains were now able to import and export products which previously could only be shipped as canned goods. Thus, the frozen food industry was created and the world and the world saw the emergence of the shopping center or the supermarket. In, uh, for the next 20 years, Fred Jones continued to make improvements on existing devices and devise new inventions when necessary to aid the public. One of those inventions in particular was the individual air conditioning unit. Fred McKinley Jones died on February 21st, 
1961, and was posthumously awarded the National Medal of Technology, one of the greatest honors an inventor could receive. He was the first black inventor to ever receive such an honor. Otis Boykin, the inventor of the control unit for pacemakers and the improved electrical resistors. Otis Boykin was born on August 29, 1920 in Dallas, Texas. After graduating high school, he attended Fisk College in Nashville, Tennessee. He graduated in 1941 and took a job as a laboratory assistant with the Majestic Radio and TV Corporation in Chicago, Illinois. Soon thereafter, he started his own business, Boykin Fruth Incorporated. At the same time, he was pursuing graduate studies at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, Illinois. He attended classes in 1946 and 1947, but was forced to drop out because he lacked the fund to pay the next year's tuition. Despite these setbacks, Otis realized that a master's degree was not a prerequisite for inventive competence, and he started to work on a project that he had thought about while in school. At that time, the field of electronics was very popular, and Otis took an interest in working with resistors. A resistor is an electric component that um, slows the flow of electrical current. This is necessary to prevent too much electricity from passing through a component than is necessary or even safe. Otis was granted a patent for a wire precision uh, resistor on June 16, 1959. This resistor allowed for specific amounts of current to flow through for a specific purpose. Wire precision resistors are used in our radios and our televisions. Two years later, he created a resistor that could be manufactured more inexpensively. Um, it was a breakthrough device as it could tolerate extreme changes in temperature and various levels of pressure without impairing its, in, its effectiveness. The chip was in great demand as he received orders from consumers, electronic companies, as well as the United States military, and of course, the electronic powerhouse, International Business Machines, IBM. Otis, though, is most famous for his invention, the, a control unit for the pacemaker. The device essentially uses electrical impulses to stimulate the heart and create a steady heartbeat. Otis Boykin proved that the setback of having to drop out of school was not enough to, defer, to deter him from his dream of becoming an inventor. And his inventions have had a long-lasting effect on the entire world. Otis, in his lifetime, ultimately invented more than 25 electronic devices. However, in tragic irony, Otis Boykin died in 1982 as a result of heart failure. They weren't able to input a pacemaker into his heart in time to save his life. George Edward Alcorn Jr., the inventor of the imaging X-ray spectrometer. A noted academic and administrator, George Alcorn is a pioneer and one of the top inventors in the field of aerospace. Born in 1922, uh, excuse me, born March 22, 1940, in Indianapolis, Indiana, George was the son of Arletta and George Alcorn Sr., an auto mechanic. George was an excellent student in high school and entered Occidental College in Los Angeles, California on an academic scholarship and graduated with honors with a degree in physics in 1962. George completed his master's work in nuclear physics in 1963 and received a PhD in atomic and, excuse me, atomic and molecular physics in 1967, both from Howard University. In 1968, 
He worked as a senior physicist at North American Rockwell, a leading aerospace company, and then as an advisory engineer for in international business systems. In um, 1978, George left IBM to work for National Air and Space Administration, NASA. George, however, is best known for his development of the imaging X-ray spectrometer, the imaging X-ray machine, which was patented on September 18, 1984. An X-ray spectrometer assists scientists in identifying a material by producing an X-ray spectrum of it, allowing it to be examined visually. This is especially advantageous when the material is not able to be broken down physically. Now, the imaging x-ray machine, which is in use today in hospitals, without it, life would be twice as hard, because could you imagine having to be cut open to see if any bones are broken, or if you had a critical mass or an illness every time you went to the hospital? Over his career, George Alcorn created numerous noteworthy inventions and secured more than 25 patents. He is a well-rounded academic and leader in the field of aerospace. He also served his community well over the years, involving himself in programs aimed at recruiting minorities and women to NASA, as well as programs to encourage inner city children to focus on science. Patricia Era Bath, inventor of a form of eye surgery using lasers. Patricia Bath was born on November 4th, 1942 in Harlem, New York, and grew up loving science. And saw only opportunity in her future. These sentiments were instilled by her parents. Her father, Rupert, was a, the first black motorman for the New York City subway system, and he wrote a newspaper column. Her mother, Gladys, was a descendant of African slaves and a Cherokee Native Americans. She worked as a housewife and a domestic. Patricia went to Charles Evan Hughes High School in New York City, uh, where she served as an editor at the school science paper and graduated in only two and a half years. In 1959, when she was 16 years old, she was selected to participate in a summer program sponsored by the National Science Foundation at New York's Yeshiva University. She worked in the field of cancer research with Dr. Robert Bernard, and uh, she developed a mathematical equation that would later be used to predict the rate of a growth of a cancer. So impressed with her findings, Dr. Bernard incorporated her research in a joint scientific paper that he presented in Washington, D.C. Publicly, her work and, this, and the knowledge and publicity of her research won Patricia an award in 1960 by Mademoiselle Magazine, which was a merit award, awarded pre that was presented annually to 10 young women demonstrating the promise of great achievement. In 1964, Patricia uh, graduated from Hunter College in New York City with a bachelor's degree. In 1968, she graduated with honors from Howard University Medical School. Her exposure to black professors and administrators had a great impact on her belief in black leadership in society. In the fall of 1968, Patricia started work as an intern at Harlem Hospital and accepted a fellowship in ophthalmology at Columbia University a year later. While working at these two facilities, she made an alarming observation. In the eye clinic in Harlem, she noticed that many of the patients suffered blindness, while very few did in Columbia's eye clinic. After further research, she concluded that blacks were twice as likely to suffer from blindness as a general population, and eight times more likely to suffer blindness as a result of glaucoma than their counterparts. 
Bath believed that the main explanation for the disparity was the lack of access to ophthalmic care for blacks and other poor people. In 1973, Patricia became the first black person to complete a residency in ophthalmology at New York University Hospital. In 1974, Patricia moved to California and became a faculty member at UCLA and Charles R. Drew University. In 1983, she co-founded and chaired the ophthalmology residency training program at UCLA and Drew Universities. She was the first black woman in the country to hold such a position. Matter of fact, she was the first woman to hold a position like that. In 1976, she co-founded the American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness, based on the principle that eyesight is a basic human right. At UCLA, Patricia continued her research on cataract disease in the United States. A cataract is the cloudiness that occurs when the lens of the eye causing blurred vision and often blindness. The standard treatment used was a mechanical drill-like device that would grind away the cataract. Patricia devised a safer and faster and more accurate approach to cataract surgery. In 1981, she began developing her most well-known invention, the laser FACO probe. The device employed a laser as well as two long tubes. One was for irrigation and the other for aspiration, suction. The laser made a small incision in the eye and vaporized the cataract within a couple of minutes. The damaged lens is then flushed out with liquids and gently extracted by the suction tube. With the liquid still being washed into the eye, a new lens is easily inserted. The new procedure not only eliminated much of the discomfort, but it increased the accuracy of the surgery. Patricia sought patent protection for her device and received patents in several countries around the world. Patricia E. Bath became the first black American woman doctor to receive a patent for a medical invention in the United States on July 6, 1989. Patricia Bath retired from UCLA in 1993 and continues to advocate vision care, outreach, and calls for attention to vision issues. Her remarkable achievements as a black woman made her proud, but her racial and gender-based obstacles did not consume her. She was often quoted as saying, yes, I'm interested in equal opportunities, but my battles are in science. Creating new technologies is difficult, but these obstacles can be overcome. Each of the inventors mentioned, they all you know, had a dream and they pursued that dream until it became a reality. Abraham Lincoln said that the patent system added the fuel of interest to the genius of, or the fire of genius. As we approach the latter decades of this century, we hand the torch of innovation and imagination to a new generation of creators and potential inventors. People like you, who can pursue their dreams until they become reality. Because black genius is truly all around us. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today here on Hero Ya program. Um, you can, if you have any questions, you are welcome to give us a call today. And uh, you can reach us at 770-559-2999. Again, my name is Celadonia Israel. I'm a member of the Congregation of Yahshua. We are a Hebrew Israelite camp. We keep Sabbath service, that is a Saturday Sabbath service, at 1 p.m. Every Saturday at 569 LaDonna Drive in Decatur, Georgia. As I stated earlier, we are admonished by our Creator to learn everything that we can about ourselves. And one of those ways is to learn about us as black people is to study our Bibles. He did tell us that we need to study to show ourselves approved, and that is 
paramount because we do understand that we as black people came to this country, we were brought here and therefore do not know who we are. However, the Bible is the best way to know because that is the source. It was made for us. It is about us. He wrote that love story for his children, the black people, the children of Israel. Um, our creator gives us ideas and understanding of things. And if the creator gives you an idea, truly believe that he will give you the means to carry it out. I believe it's best said, he said in Ecclesiastes 3.23, so I saw that there was nothing better for a man or a woman than to enjoy his work because that is our lot. So thank you again for joining us here. Have a great day. We are back. Welcome to the Hear O Yah program. That was the beautiful Celadonia Israel. We are the congregation of Yahshua, believers in the word of Yah, and not just believe, we have to do it through faith, and it is demonstrated by our works. 770-559-2999. It is interesting to me as we look at America and what she brought was a fascinating expose of the intelligence of our people. It's not uncommon for us to have genius among us. What is uncommon is for us to recognize that that genius can elevate us above those of our captors. Those who would keep us oppressed, depressed, suppressed, repressed, so that they can then use us for the benefit of themselves. When she talked about the patents that our people have developed over the years, the question is how many of those patents to this day have continued to finance the mighty and the holy people? We have a system of inequity, impropriety, injustice, and when we look at the various aspects of white supremacy and how they have denied due process, it is the knowledge of Jim Crow, which our beloved sisters Tamar and Samara brought weeks before. Last week we had te technical difficulties, so we were not live. But this week we brought the hope of our people, even after Jim Crow and the white supremacist regime that has tried to suppress the mighty and the holy people, we have inventors throughout that time that came up and were champions among our people to debunk the myth that we were, first of all, not human, three-fifths of a human according to their law, and did not have the intellect to perform various tasks that would make not only America the slave's life better, but the world itself. Certainly we also know that many of these inventions were part of the complicit compromise that the slaves had to, were forced into based on necessity. But guess what? Necessity is the mother of invention.
And as we find the mighty and the holy people have invented very many things that would help this society become the hammer of the earth that the Messiah will return to turn into what? Little chips because the hammer has been hammering on what? The poor, the disenfranchised, the meek, the elderly and children. America has created an agenda for those of us who are willing to accept it and that is that of unity. Another great inventor which you may want to add and Google is a great fighter, a warrior, his name Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson has more patents and has invented more things than you would ever even know and then we get in the ring and beat the tar out of one of them white boys. Now understand this, when we look at our children's education system or the miseducation system or the lack of education, the dumbing down of America, we will find that even during the times when we were more, more or less less educated, we came up with more inventions, we saved more money, we owned more business, we had more entrepreneurial spirit than we do to this day when we are supposed to be highly educated. Well, we find that this education has taught us to be simple stalwarts in the, the destiny of America. We have found faith and hope in the American nightmare of white supremacy through a governmental system that has now used the utilities company. You know, I had the opportunity to call the powerful reasoning voice of Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton, as many of you know, has a nationally syndicated program. The conversation I had with him was about the criminalization of the poor under a capitalist regime with the use of the utilities companies as their tool. The utilities companies and the hydroelectric plant in particular is what I will use as an analogy. When we look at the water flowing in a great roaring river, it predated not only the Georgia Power and all of its subsidiaries, it predated man itself. But the white European arrogance and selfish pride and global thuggery that they used to take the resources of those indigenous people through a collective agenda of white supremacy and white privilege will go in and create a dam in that river. Not discounting what will happen into down river to the environment, not discounting that the river itself is a powerful example of Yah and his creation, but because they have the military might to do it, they will go take that river and dam it up. Now, when they dam that river up, guess what they use for the resources to build the dam? You, your taxes. You pay for the dam, just like now we're paying for a nuclear plant that is projected to be built down the road five to ten years. You're paying for it right now, and it has nothing to do with whether you vote for it or not. It is a compunction of a white capitalist regime that will take from the poor and give to the wealthy. Back to the river and the hydroelectric plant. Your taxes paid for that plant. Now that plant is built on a raging river and the water is still flowing. But guess what? The money from your pockets is still flowing too. Because right after this white devil and his capitalist system takes that money from you through taxes to build this hydroelectric plant, now is now fouling the air and creating havoc in the fisheries and the transportation or the circulation of the water's planet, the planet's water, then they start to charge you and I for something that we have already paid for. Taxes come from your pocket and mine, but under a capitalist regime, re, regime and agenda, trying to mix those two words, they don't care. So now, 
after they took your money to build it, now they're going to take your money for the generation of the electricity that you already paid for. Then, let's look right here to where uh, Atlanta Zoo is, at uh, the Grant Park area. A very wise man decided to use an ancient concept of wind energy. He decided to build a windmill in his backyard to supplement the power to his house. See, this is the thing. The utilities have been used to subjugate and impoverish and create an unlimited financial stream for the white oligarchy. After they have built these facilities, what should they be doing with your tax money? They should be using the, using the inventive genius that they have and the excess of funds to outfit residences with solar power, wind power, where other devices where they could actually generate power and then push power back into the mainstream. There are certain homes that produce enough power to where Georgia Power has to play them, pay them for the amount of power that they are generating. This is not the agenda of white supremacy, capitalism, and white privilege, rather than them using the excess funds from your taxes to build adequate solar, wind, uh, other types of alternative fuels to supplement the power to reduce the amount of fluorocarbons being permitted, uh, emitted into the air, and to reduce the amount of energy that is being used, what would they do? They would rather continue to take your money, take the money through the bills that they generate where you don't have ability to uh, deny them the truth or whether that bill is accurate or not, and continue to subjugate the people. See, when we look at capitalism and we look at the way they have have set things up. It, the inventions of our forefathers have done nothing to help further our people's plight in extricating ourselves from a white capitalist system. The only thing that will separate us and that will help us is the creator, Yah, because he has set an agenda for his people. He's shown the world. Not only do we have the intellect, the Rosewood, Auburn Avenue, Black Wall Street, Tulsa, Oklahoma. He has showed uh, Jonestown in Marietta where Dobbins Air Force Base set down its wings. They have shown that we have the intellect, we have the power and the ability to be self-determining. But because of white supremacy and the creator, Yah himself, has put us in the position of subservience, we were going to have to do this time under this white system with all the genius and beauty that we have until the return of the great king. Because even though we have equal opportunity to designate the truth of the word, we don't have equal application of it in the system. I want to thank you for watching this program. We want to bring more of you here. We've got one minute left and I'm coming out on this one minute. Remember, this program was built on building bridges to unity. We worship Yah. We don't try to control what you say. This is your program. Come and be a part of it. Hope to see you next week. Peace in the Middle East, in your hearts. And right here, peace, we have.